So it's time for us to check back in with Louisa in Mountain Path and see what happens next. Each day, the children had more to tell of the Christmas preparations going forward in their homes and teacher was gay again and helped in the planning. No plum puddings or fruit cakes here, but homely things, dried apple pies, molasses cakes and cookies, souse meat, sausage, and pumpkin butter were the most common of their delicacies. The more affluent, such as the cows and pomps, might use sugar to cook with, but others were more often restricted in their choice of a sweetening, being limited chiefly to molasses and honey. Corey, it appeared, was striving to outdo every woman in the valley in this new business of cooking for Christmas. Not content with the manufacture of great quantities of hominy, souse meat, sausage, and dried apple pie, she tried her hand at fancy cookies modeled after the red sugar cookies teacher had told the children of. One night, while Louisa sewed on a rag doll for Hattie, the three-year-old Brander Seuss Mies baby, Corey, instead of quilt piecing as usual, thumbed the Sears Roebuck catalog with all the assiduity of a preacher thumbing the Bible in quest of a scripture quotation to prove some disputed point. What are you looking for, Mom? Rye wanted to know as she carefully cracked a black walnut on the hearth. Cookie patterns fur to make cookies like the ones teacher told yuns about. If and you did order them, they'd never get here before in time for Christmas, and I bet they'd maybe cost 50 cents, the shrewd child answered, drawing forth the half of a walnut kernel. That's the truth, Corey agreed, closing the catalog and staring at the fire. But I did want to make me some of them cookies. She was silent and no one offered a suggestion. Louisa saw no way of cutting cookies without cutters and Rye, usually so inventive, seemed occupied with her task of cracking walnuts so as to get the kernels out in the biggest possible pieces. After a time of staring at the fire, Corey arose, hunted the scissors and brought two paper bags from the kitchen, then seated herself again with nothing said. She folded the paper in peculiar fashion, cut, unfolded, folded and cut again, and unfolded it into a five-pointed star. What are you aiming to do with that now? Rye wanted to know. You use paper patterns for to cut dresses, her mother answered defensively, so I'm a aiming to use paper patterns for cookie dough and cut it with a knife instead of scissors. Teacher, ain't you got a bell pattern and a Santa Claus? Teacher produced the bell and Santa Claus, and next day, while she and the children were gone, Corey spent the most of her time with the cookies. Louisa and the children were duly appreciative, and though the cookies were neither so good nor so pretty as the average cookie, they were the first Christmas cookies Cal Valley had ever known, and the teacher judged them accordingly. Corey was proud of her work and made enough for the whole school with some to spare. Christmas Eve, the day of the entertainment, dawned slowly with slow rain on the roof and even gray skies touching the pine tops on the ridges. Louisa had hoped that the day would be fair so that all her children and their parents might come for the celebration which was to begin shortly after noon recess. During breakfast, the rain changed to snow so that Lee Buck predicted a white Christmas and a good crop year and Rye and Pete made plans for tracking rabbits in the snow on Christmas Day. The snow continued as they walked to school, falling so thickly as to hide the hilltops and make white ghosts of the poplar trees by the church. The schoolhouse was deserted. Not even the fireman Mark had come, but Rye rushed about and soon the place was warm, as warm as a house with cracks in the floor and knot holes in the walls could be made. They waited some time, and as no one appeared and the snow continued, Louisa began to feel dispirited. She continued to feel that way until some two hours later when it was time for morning recess and the most of her children came in one body. Not only the children, their fathers and their mothers and older brothers and sisters married and with children of their own. Only the women and children came into the house. The men built a fire by the road and stood by it in the whirling snow or walked about stamping their feet to keep them warm. None deigned to shiver or hunch his shoulders as a man of less tough breed might have done. Shivering was for women and children and the sick. 
Inside the house, Seuss Meese, Lucy Dykes, Miss Pomp, and other women stood timidly by the stove saying nothing at all to teacher and little among themselves, and when they did, speaking it in abashed undertones. The young children were at first but little more at ease than their mothers, standing in a closed circle by the stove, but after a time, curiosity overcame them, and gradually they gravitated toward the Christmas tree and stood worshiping it in mute adoration or talked with shy eagerness of the treat that was to come and of the part their older brothers and sisters or aunts and uncles had in the program. Almost all had brought a present for teacher, strange bulky objects wrapped in pokes or flour sacks, untrimmed packages, not a few done up in mail-ordered catalog leaves for lack of anything better. Corey and Lee Buck were among the first to come, completely covered with damp, large flakes of snow, and bowed under two bulging gunny sacks which they deposited under the Christmas tree. Lee Buck took his place outside among the other men, and Corey remained inside and seated herself by the stove and at once took unto herself the duties of hostess by putting the women at their ease with her comments and questions concerning all the little trivial, trivial things that made the total of their lives. It was almost noon by that time, and as the unexpected earliness of her visitors had completely upset Louise's daily schedule, she suggested that the program be got over with so that the people who were doubtless hungry might go home to their dinners. A little silence fell upon the women. Corey, however, did not remain long without speaking. Well, the fact is, teacher, I reckon we had the idea we'd get hungry, and I think everybody brought a bite. And she looked at the other women with an elaborate show of inquiry. All without either speaking or moving their heads indicated that Corey was correct in her pretended assumptions and after another period of absolute silence, all arose as if by some prearranged signal and went for the boxes and baskets and tin pails. Corey, with a few suggestions from teacher now, quitted her role as hostess for that of mistress of the board, and quite a board it proved to be. Under her direction, the most of the but seats were pushed against the wall, the two backless benches sat near the stove, and over these she spread two flour sack sheets she had evidently brought for the purpose. Go ask your pop about the coffee, she directed some one of her children, and the children went into the yard and returned presently, followed by Lee Buck and Pomp, bearing a lard can of steaming coffee which they set on the stove. Louisa was more than a little surprised at the communal Christmas dinner blossoming before her, but asked no questions and busied herself with placing food on the two benches, which soon proved inadequate, and two of the pupils' desks must be put into use. She could not remember ever having seen such a heterogeneous abundance of food. Some word of Corey's Christmas cookies and other preparations must have gone abroad so that every good housewife in the school district had seemingly tried to outdo her, if not in the ingenuity, at least in quantity. Mrs. Rand's Dykes had even sent by her husband, the mail carrier, for store-bought bread and cheese, though no one, she herself not accepted, would eat of the loaf bread except teacher. There was every part of the hog present that could be cooked. Beef was also present in great quantities, as well as chicken, boiled, baked, and fried. Squirrel and rabbit were not lacking, and it was whispered about by Miss Pomp that the Brander Seuss Mises had brought goat meat, but none were able to prove it. No one brought vegetables, but hominy and potatoes, both sweet and white, were there. Pickles there were of every shape, size, and kind. Pickled cucumbers, tomatoes, peppers, peaches, crab apples, green walnuts, and watermel watermelon rind were the most numerous. There were jellies and preserves of all fruits native to the valley. Apple, wild plum, wild strawberry, grape, gooseberry, muscadine, blackberry, huckleberry, peach, and cherry squatted about the table in a multitude of jars. Pastries were by no means lacking. Pies and puddings that Louisa did not know existed. 
persimmon pudding, vinegar pie, sweet potato pie, and buttermilk pie took their place alongside their better known cousins such as dried apple pie and pumpkin. When all the food was either on the benches or by them, children were sent to bring as many men as could be inveigled into the house and especially directed not to return without Brander Meese, who was to ask a blessing. After a little delay, Lee Buck and Hayes and Pomp and Rans Dykes entered. They being the most affluent of the citizens, it was only expected that they should be the first to come in. Brander and Herbs de Gaulle and some of the River Meese men came soon after, and after a little time the blessing, which turned out to be a long prayer of thanksgiving and supplication, got underway. The children's appetites were so whetted by the long prayer and the sight of the mouth-watering mountain of food that when the prayer was finished, they could scarcely wait until the men in the house were provided with cold biscuits and some variety or varieties of meat. Later, younger men, whom Louisa did not know, drifted in and shyly partook of the food. The coffee caused not a little trouble and delay. There were few cups or glasses about, but all good-naturedly took turns with the tin dipper, glasses, fruit jars, and drinking cups of the schoolchildren. Louisa found herself thinking of Chris and wondered if he sat at home by the fire with only the hound dogs for company. Since the night at church, he had not ventured beyond the narrow limits of the lower valley. Lee Buck would not have it. There were yet men about who either because of timidity or a fear of seeming too forward by partaking of a feast to which they had brought nothing remained outside. She thought that Chris might be among them, and chiefly because of him, suggested to Corey and Seuss that the men, that since the men would not come to the food when there was plenty for all, some of the feast might be taken to them. Corey immediately fell in with the suggestion and emptied the zinc water pail of its water, dried it on a corner of the sheet tablecloth, lined it with paper from the store-bought bread, and into it helter-skelter put beef, pork, chicken, and squirrel. Teacher took a basket of cornbread and biscuit. Rye and some of the other children followed with an assortment of pickles in jars, while Suze and Miss Pomp brought pieces of pie and cake. All of them walked about in the snow and gave food to the men who accepted it with many a sober, thank you, ma'am. Chris came while they were outside and Louisa saw with some surprise that he had dressed for the occasion in clothes she had never seen before wearing a gray overcoat and gray hat. She could not help but think that he was handsome as he came toward her through the snow, his eyes frostily blue in the cold, and for once the even brown of his face broken a bit with thin bars of color on his high cheekbones. I was afraid you were not coming, she said, forgetting to offer him bread as she had offered it to the other men. I would come, he said, without smiling. Is it safe? she asked. There are strangers here, and it is so near. I don't know, he answered, frowning a little. I don't think anybody would come for me here, not with Lee Buck and Hayes and Pomp and the Meese boys. They are your friends, she said aloud without realizing that she did so. They would fight for you and maybe get killed. Not for me, for Kells and K.D. and all the other men that went the same way. If you're afraid of trouble, I'll go back. I'm not afraid. Don't go. I'm sorry I spoke about it on Christmas. Speaking helps, he answered, and the desolation of his voice chilled her and made her feel alone and insecure among all the pleasant company of people. She thought of the men and women and children gathered there, eating and drinking, and apparently with no thought of trouble, yet carrying in their hearts old hatreds and bitter memories that would live when teacher and her Christmas tree were forgotten. Chris's desolation was not that of one man, but of a race, the race of the poor and proud and free. Because they insisted on doing things in which they saw no lawlessness, they must be forever hunted and hounded and made to kill and in turn be killed. They might go away and live in cities, and still they would be poor and underprivileged and unhappy. She looked at Chris and was sad that she must think of all this today. 
Think of the hard, unyielding bone of him and his people and not see it with the eyes of a bystander, but with the sympathetic eyes of another human, the unfinished, perplexed misfit in the only world she knew, herself. You're shivering, Chris said, and moved toward the house. I'm not cold, she said, and was truthful in that she felt no cold, but went with him into the house where all the women made much of him in their reserved way, commenting on his fine clothes and bringing coffee and other things remaining from the feast. The program began shortly after, and though there was no applause, Louisa felt prouder, perhaps, than some theatrical producer at the first night of his first smash hit on Broadway. The children spoke their pieces well. The songs went off better than expected, though in Jingle Bells there was some confusion concerning the horse. Rye and Mabel, representing the more sophisticated element, trilled horse after the manner of teacher, while Clyde Meese and Pomp's son Royal sang hoss in robust tones. The gifts and the treats swelled by Corey's cookies and apples and chestnuts and popcorn from various of the other families were then distributed, and in spite of the unexpected number of small children present, there was enough for all. Lee Buck made a Santa Claus in overalls and seemed immensely pleased to officiate in that capacity. Louisa had some time before talked with Corey concerning the feasibility of a red Santa Claus suit for some man to wear, but Corey had quickly pointed out the impossibility of such a plan. First, there was not a man in the valley who could be got to wear it. Secondly, it would cost money, and lastly, it did teetotally scare the little youngins out of their heads. And so the school went Santa Clausless, but had a good enough time without one. During the distribution of the gifts, Louisa noticed for the first time the absence of one of her pupils, Molly Meese, ten-year-old sister of Clyde and six-year-old Bill. Teacher recalled now that the child had been present yesterday, though her younger brother Bill was absent. She had stood much about the tree and looked at it with that sad, wistful stare common to her race. The teacher understood now. Molly had known yesterday that she could not come today when the candles were lighted. At the first opportunity, she questioned Suze, the child's mother, as to the reason for Molly's absence. Suze looked at the stove and played with her baby's hair. Molly, uh, she had to stay home, teacher. She just, she just couldn't come. Louisa might have pressed her more for a definite reason had she not caught Corey's warning eye in time to notice something akin to shame come into Susie's weathered face. It was only a matter of moments until Corey had teacher in a far corner of the room by the blackboard where Suze could not hear their whispers. Teacher, don't ask that poor soul where her youngin is. I reckon you've noticed the little boy and Molly ain't been a-coming both at the same time since the weather got bad, Corey told her, glancing compassionately at Susie's bent back. I do remember since you mention it, but why can't they both come? Corey made her whispers yet softer. They have to take turn about with the one pair of shoes. Susie's youngins never all have shoes. That brander may be a finin' to make pretty prayers, but when it comes to being a good provider and keeping his youngins in shoes, Lee Buck's got him skinned a mile, if in prior words and cuss words are all the same to him. I'm glad you told me, Louisa said. I won't ask again. Thoughts of shoeless Molly hurt her for a time, but teacher forgot her again during the excitement of opening her presents. She'd given each of her school children some little inexpensive trifle, things of course which they had never had before, and all were enormously pleased with their gifts, but not nearly so much as teacher who exclaimed with wonder and delight at the many things she received. Lander and Mabel gave her something she had once professed a desire for and then forgotten, a group of song ballads written with much fine penmanship and poor spelling by their father, Hayes. There was a handsome stocking cap from old Aunt Haley Tucker, grandmother of Pomp's children, a neatly whittled paddle from Clyde Meese, a small box cut from a solid piece of cedar wood, Pete's present, doubtless whittled by Chris or Lee Buck, a tobacco sack pin cushion from Rye, 
handkerchiefs from Mark Dykes and one of the Stagalls gave her a large bundle of the richest pine splinters to be had so there never need be any trouble with the fire building. When the gifts were all undone and people were calling their children together for starting home, Clyde Meese came suddenly to her side and shoved a little packet wrapped with catalog leaves into her hand. Molly said to give you this, he mumbled and hurried away. She undid the thin leaves of paper and in their center was a little mound of wintergreen berries badly crushed and dried but still fragrant. Louisa folded the pictured advertisements of farm machinery about the berries again and put them carefully into her jacket pocket. The child must have spent hours in the rain and snow gathering that gift. Dr. Lieberman said, Sentiment has little or no place in this our modern civilization. Certainly not for you. You, my unfortunate young men and women, must learn to reason. She hadn't learned. She was happy, happier than she could remember ever having been before, and all because a handful of people, their illiteracy exceeded only by their poverty, had this day shown that they liked her and were pleased that she was among them. Teacher could not leave the schoolhouse with the others, but must stay to put figures in her record book, straighten the room a little, and wait for the fire to die until it was low enough to leave safely. Rye and Pete lingered behind to help, and Chris stayed too, for Rye said they would need him to help carry all teachers' presents home. The door was locked at last, but the children, tempted by the new white snow, gave their bundles to Chris and said they would go on the hill above the school road and track rabbits until night work time. Teacher, you and me ought to go hunting tomorrow. There might be pheasants on Jackson's Ridge, Chris said as they walked down the road. I'd like to, Louisa told him. I've never seen a pheasant. There maybe might not be any in these parts, but over the border in Tennessee, just back from home, the woods are full. Last Christmas Day, Kells and me killed five. I imagine you and he had good times together. Yes, the other boys, four, was older. All moved away, but KD, he got shot too, before Kells. Chris's willingness to talk and some feeling of intimacy bred by walking along together caused her to question him a thing she had never done before. This Bill Daltrey you told me of killed your brother, didn't he? She asked. No sooner were the words spoken than she could have cried with shame and hurt at watching all softness, all feeling, all thought one might say die from the lean brown face until it was a stone face set in lines of insane hatred. She caught his sleeve. I'm so sorry, Chris. Let's don't talk about it. Sometimes, he said, walking on, I think talking might have helped at first. I've thought on him and them at home all day. He was silent then, but she knew he would say more in time. Feared he would. She did not want to watch the torture in his face. They had passed the church house before he spoke. If I talked, I maybe might not think so much. Then, too, you might see. Kells was a good boy, always laughing, easy going, joking a lot like Lee Buck. I can't be like he was. He helped at the still along with the rest of us. Pap and me and Bert Anderson, he was my sister's husband. I was gone one day, so was Pap. We'd always been careful and buried the whiskey at night, but that day Kells and Bert had nothing to do and took a notion to bury a few jugs we had on hand. They was in the field. It was late March. I remember the day, clear with a strong wind and the leaves just coming out. It was after dinner. They was digging in a field on the other side of the hill from home. Before they hardly knowed what was happening, two men rode up. They was this Bill Drawtree and Sol Coger, brother to the tall man that night at church. He is Perry Coger. The men yelled something. Bert reached for his gun. They shot him down with an automatic shotgun. Kells didn't have a gun. He tried to run. They got him too, in the back. He fell with his face in a pile of dirt from a hole he had dug. Bert was on his back. The sun was shining in his wide open eyes. 
They had almost reached the rail fence now, and Chris walked on staring straight before him, talking in a slow, toneless voice. The men rode by my sister's place. They was afraid to come by home. We've had to shoot two men up yonder that resisted arrest for moonshine, one said, and they went away. My sister walked up there. She found them. Kel's little dog had stayed with them. Bert was dead. Kel's was still alive. She got him home to mom. He come to a little. He told him about it. Then he died. They came to the fence and Chris leaned his long body against it and looked off down the valley. Mom met me at the big gate. I was on Bert's mule. She didn't cry. Your pop's too old, she said. I understood. I rode away to Isham. I found Sol Colger. He fell on his back the way Bert had. The moon was shining. I couldn't find Bill Daltrey. I looked a long time. Then Cy Duncan, the high sheriff in that county, come. He used to be a neighbor of ours just across the border. He took no hand in all this revenue business in Kentucky. Come on, Chris, he said. Put the other one in jail, I said. I can't, he said. Why can't you, I said. I reached for my gun. Don't be forehanded, he said. He's gone. He gave me a long, steady look. Where to, I said. He gave me another long look and looked at the moon. I see, I said. I handed him my gun. You can't get him? Not in Beulah land, he said, and took me to the jailhouse. He had lied to me. I can't blame him now. He didn't want another Kentucky deputy killed in his town. He come around midnight. The jailer was with him and the jailer's wife. I could see what she was thinking. Kells used to sell her butter. Her eyes were harder than the men's. We sat for a long time and didn't talk. Finally, the high sheriff said, I got to be getting along. We'll see about Belle tomorrow. They walked to the door. Then they all stopped and turned around and looked at me. They eat breakfast early in jail, the high sheriff said. 5.30. The woman here will bring it. Be ready to eat it when it comes. She'll have the tray in her two hands like this, and he held up his hands. She knocked early next morning. It was pitch dark. I had my hat on. She had the tray in her hands. She set it down to unlock the door. Then she picked it up again. Open the door, she said. I've got my hands full. I opened it some. Wider, she said. She walked in. She walked past me to the bunk. She stood there with the tray. Goodbye, she said. I couldn't say anything. I walked through the door. The key was on the outside. I still have that key. Bert's mule was saddled and bridled. My gun with no load in it was on him too. I rode home. They begged me to come here. They said Bill Daltrey was out of the country then. I couldn't take the chance of getting took before I got him, so I come here. He swung over the fence mechanically, helped Louisa over, and in silence walked down through the cornrows. She was glad that it was finished. The words, at least. The story he told was not finished. She understood now. Back there in the wagon, when he talked of not owning the world, she had not understood. She had thought the debt he owed was to society, a debt he must pay by going to prison. Now she knew differently. The only debt he owed was to himself. The only thing that could pay that was the death of another man. Strange how she could see it all with his eyes, learn what he had done and what he wanted to do, and feel no condemnation. Only a great pity for him. Or was it all pity? He was so handsome and so gentle and so cold. He hardly knew she was a woman. It was better that he didn't know, easier for her. She ought not to go alone with him again. It was milking and barn work time when they reached home, and teacher, who didn't want to be alone, took Beetle and walked to the barn with the others and watched the yellow light of the swinging lanterns cut bright swaths across the snow and heard the trees on the hill crack with the cold. In the barn, she sat and watched Corey at the milking and listened to her talk of Christmas back yonder when people made a powerful, strong drink out of honey and called it methelglum. 
She took grave heed of her warning to burn all holly and mistletoe before old Christmas so as not to have bad luck at the coming year. That was the night the cows knelt and prayed at midnight. Yes, once when she was a little girl, she had seen the mud on the cow's knees. It was only that night when Corey was in bed and the men gone to the cave and she sat alone by her little fire in the loft room that she remembered Samantha T. had not come. She recalled the dolefulness of the girl's black eyes that night on the pine ridge and the old weariness in her voice when she said, You've got too good a turn to die. He looked so handsome in his gray suit, and he liked the world he lived in so. And tomorrow they would tramp together through the snow and hunt pheasants on the ridges, and when he looked at the hills, blue line upon blue line of them penciled sharp in the cold, that still wistful look would come into his eyes as if he knew better than she or Samantha T or the other end that nothing rightly belonged to him. She cried a little then, soundlessly, as she had always cried on those Christmas nights a long time ago. Wow. Another great chapter. Not exactly ending in happiness, but at least they got to have the happiness of the Christmas party, the Christmas tree, she was calling it. Um, I love that beginning, all the joyfulness of the people coming together and the way they surprised teacher with the bounty of food. Oh my goodness, wasn't the description of the food wonderful? Wouldn't you have liked to have been there to eat some of it? I would have liked that a lot. I especially love, this time it was Corey that was inventive, which she was already inventive. Remember way back at the very first chapter how she had made the... Um, stir that she could use her foot to stir the apple butter, you know, the long um, pole that she had that went down into the pot. So she was already inventive but or um, smart about trying to figure out how to do things, how to save herself time. So as they sat there and talked about the Christmas cookies, she come up with that great idea is to trace out the cookies on a, from the pattern just like you would fabric. So that's really, I really loved that part that she figured out how to make her cookies. That was very nice. Still in this chapter, even with all the, the happiness of the Christmas and of the cookies that um, Corey figured out how to make and, and all the presents that Louisa loved, you can still see this. She just cannot understand these people. She loves them. She's happy to be with them. But on some level, she just can't understand the way that they look at the world. Um, I think that's really something we can all learn from like it's easy for me to judge louisa like well why can't you see they're like they are proud people and this happened and this happened you know but so many times we don't give other uh, people that would from different cultures we should give them that same like what i'm feeling to louisa i should feel like that about everybody is that we can't understand you can only understand the life that you've lived and the customs uh even down to it's funny um, if you're married, then you know this when you're first married, especially I've been married a long time. It's so many things. Of course, you agree on, you know, you know about the, the big things you agree, agree on, I hope, if you're married and you know that before you take that huge step. But there's so many little things. It's like, um, you know, you've heard the joke, like people will say, well, I didn't know my husband or my wife leaves toothpaste in the sink till we were married. All those little little idiosyncrasies i guess or how you look at the world once you begin living with people then you really see that you really see it firsthand like oh well didn't your mama teach you to pick up your clothes or you know why don't you cook supper every night my mama did all those kind of things that we bring those kind of cultural things with us so you can see louisa still really struggling with that part uh, but on the other hand, then, like when she was quoting, shared the quote from Dr. Lieberman, which I guess was one of her instructors, one of her professors from college, you know, telling her that, telling them that sentiment was not real. Uh, and she certainly realized it is. Here's these people who are poor, who are illiterate, all that thing, who lead, lead these uh, lives that she finds so strange with their pride and their hatred and their cultural uh, battles that are having in that in that area where they live, their feuds. Uh, but at the same time, they've shown her such great love, and she really admires them. She respects them. So it's that kind of, she's already realized, well, the professor's wrong. I still don't fully understand, but I understand enough to know he's wrong. There is great sentiment, and it's that's something we should live our lives with, that happiness. Um, those, those touching things that monetarily don't matter at all, maybe reason doesn't play into it, but the way it makes you feel uh, tugs on your heartstrings for sure. 
And then we finally get to know what happened with Chris. We finally get the mystery solved in this chapter. So um, still sounds so crazy. So they were in the field. Of course, they were doing what they shouldn't have done with the moonshine, but then it sounds like the men come from nowhere and killed them on purpose, and, and now Chris has killed one of them, and he still wants to kill the other one. So now we finally know what that was all about. So two of our... Uh, Chris's brother and his brother-in-law both killed by the men, and that's why he feels like he needs to avenge their death. So there's all the mystery right there. Isn't it interesting how the sheriff, how he played in a role, the high sheriff, that's something I would hear Pat uh, say even like in my lifetime, the sheriffs of, Cher of Cherokee County, since I was a kid, they were just called the sheriff. But when Pap talked about them, he was mentioning something about the sheriff. He would always say the high sheriff, the high sheriff. So that was um, something I heard from Pap, that term my whole life. But, it, but anyway, the sheriff, you know, fixed it where Chris escaped. He gave him the, basically gave him the key, gave him the way out. So then that makes you think, well, did he think Chris was right? Did he kind of understand the culture that they had to make the moonshine for money to survive? And, you know, I don't know. But that was, that was very interesting, that part. So I hope that you'll share a comment, leave a comment, and tell me in this chapter, what did you like? I know that you were like me and loved the Christmas part of, of them surprising Louisa with all the food and her worrying about them, thinking, well, you need to go on home and eat dinner because you've got to be hungry. And they're like, no, actually, <laughs> we brought it all with us. So I, I really like that part. Of course, the saddest part of that little um, part of the chapter where it's describing all that is the little girl that didn't have the shoes that her and her brother had to share. Oh, my heart goes out to her. That part is really sad. Uh, but hopefully they took some of those uh, treats back home with her and that that cheered her up. But I really liked that part, and I'm sure you did. But please leave a comment and let me know what else you what else jumped out at you. And if you're, if you're like me and you're glad now, you finally know what the mystery was. Uh, I've read the book before, but it's been so long that I couldn't remember. I couldn't remember what actually had happened to Chris. So now we know. We know that part. And as always, I hope you'll drop back by because we've got to find out what happens next with Louisa in Mountain Path.